Hello, and welcome to the History of the Railways, a podcast with the ridiculous goal of telling the story of the railways across the world. Season 1, Episode 1, Predecessors. Most railway histories start with the long pedigree that steam power has, almost certainly finding a way to mention Hero of Alexandria and trying to tie that to the actual railways themselves. And it's fascinating, but in truth, it's probably not why you've come to a podcast titled History of the Railways. So we're going to start later, much later. There's disagreement over what counts as the first railway. Is it the Oystermouth Railway or the Stockton and Darlington, the Liverpool and Manchester, or even Middleton Railway? In episode 4, we're going to use the first recognisably modern railway, the Liverpool and Manchester, as our springboard to the rest of the series. But the L&M didn't spring fully formed from the head of Zeus, or even the plural heads of William James, Joseph Sanders and George Stevenson. So, before we get going, I want to spend a couple of episodes covering the background and putting the 1830 birth of the Liverpool and Manchester into a bit of context. Along the way, each of those other candidates gets a mention, and in the case of the Stockton and Darlington, even a whole show. So by the time we reach episode 4, we should be well positioned to understand why the L&M was able to take off. So, at its bottom, a railway needs two things to work. A track and some form of motive power. And of course, if the railway doesn't already exist, and you want to carry anything on it, then you're going to need two more things. People to build it, and some rolling stock. All of these were in place before the Liverpool and Manchester, and we know for sure that if the Liverpool and Manchester hadn't brought them together, then others would have. How do we know for sure? Because there were 47 other railways whose acts had already been approved by Parliament between 1825 and 1830. Now, not all of those 47 would get built, of course. Just getting an act passed didn't guarantee success. But enough of them were built, including the Canterbury and Whitstable and the Leicester and Swannington, just to pick two at random, that would probably have developed into full railways, even if the LMR hadn't. It wouldn't be very interesting to list all of the others here, but if you want to check out the full list, you can see it at historyoftherailways.com slash episode one. Anyway, suffice it to say that if it hadn't been the LNMR, someone was going to do it. The railway was an idea whose time had come. The next episode will focus completely on motive power, so for today I want to cover the other three elements. But before we get into any of that, I want to pause slightly at the beginning and explain a point that I just glossed over. Acts. Now, there'll be plenty of times through the rest of the series when I'll mention an act in relation to a particular railway, so what's all that about? As we'll see in later episodes, the British government took a laissez-faire approach to developing the railways. And by laissez-faire, I mean they didn't bother doing any developing at all. Or any planning. Much better to leave all of that to a bewildering assortment of companies, all motivated by self-interest. Now, arguably a top-down approach could have ended up with a much more sensible network, and less slash and burn later, an approach that was taken on the continent. But that's not the way things went here. And for our purposes, I guess it might have been less interesting. So swings and roundabouts. However, what the British government did do was regulate the formation of companies. I suppose it hardly needs to be said that from a land perspective, roads and railways are long, thin affairs. If they're to go anywhere useful, then they usually need to cross land that's owned by more than one person. And they cost a lot of money to build, usually more money than one person was willing to risk on their own. So setting up a company was the perfect solution to both of those problems. You could pool the money from a number of investors, and, because in the early 19th century setting up a company meant getting a special act of parliament, it was possible for the company to be given the right to force landowners to sell land that the railway needed. Perfect. And from a historical point of view, it means that we're in the lucky position of having a near-complete record of the railways that were planned. Of course, Getting an Act of Parliament passed was no small thing, so the drama usually began long before any physical work was done. Many of the railways that form a core part of our story were rejected the first time they were submitted to Parliament. Sometimes, though rarely, because Parliament judged that they weren't in the public interest, but more usually because of some sort of technicality, and most often of all, simply because the opposition to the railway had lobbied more effectively than its supporters. 
Anyway, throughout the rest of the series, when we talk about an act for such and such a railway, that's why. The best way to set up a railway was to set up a company, and setting up a company meant getting an act of parliament passed at Westminster. Out of interest, there was nothing specific to railways in any of this. Much like the other elements we'll be looking at, all of this existed before the railways were even thought of. The first similar act was for the creation of a toll road between Wadsmill and Stilton in 1663, and 92 similar acts were approved for canals through the 1700s. Okay, so with the legal situation out of the way, let's take a look at the four essential elements I highlighted earlier and consider the state of the art in the 1820s before the railways as we understand them arrived. Let's start with the track. The idea of using a track to guide some sort of wagon is very old indeed. The oldest example we know of is the Diolkos of ancient Greece, which ran across the Isthmus of Corinth. I should probably just pause here and say that uh, I'm almost certainly pronouncing that wrong, but since we're not going to talk about it for long, I'm going to plough on. Anyway, as you'd expect, the Diolkos isn't a full railway here. In fact, it didn't even have rails in the true sense. Instead, the tracks of the Diolkos were made by cutting two parallel V-shaped grooves into stone slabs which were laid from one side of the Isthmus of Corinth to the other. The tracks were approximately five feet apart, and they were used to guide the wheels of carts. And there are two things that make it particularly fascinating from a railway point of view. The first, obviously, just how old it is. Nobody knows for sure when it was built, but when the Greek historian Thucydides wrote about it in around about 430 BC, he already thought it was ancient. Based on the inscriptions on some of the stones, historians currently estimate that it was built around 600 BC, and it stayed in use until the Roman Emperor Nero cut it off by building a canal through the same era. So we're talking about 650, 700 years, which is longer than any of the railways we've had so far. The other thing that's interesting to us is that while the records we have in ancient documents all talk about it being used in times of war, it was used to transport boats to and from battle more quickly, Michael Lewis has argued convincingly that its main use must have been commercial, which means this was a railway which was open to the paying public, something that wouldn't be seen again for another two and a half thousand years. Anyway, although the Diolkos is interesting, it isn't really possible to trace a direct line from it to the modern railways. However, the next step on the journey to a modern track is a lot more direct. In fact, they can be considered the direct ancestors of the modern railways. Mine wagonways. Wagonways were common in Germany in the 1500s, and there are even isolated examples from the 1300s and 1400s, but the earliest one documented in Britain was built by a chap called Huntingdon Beaumont, which is quite the name to play with, isn't it, in about 1603, and ran for about two miles from Strelly to Wollaton near Nottingham. Other contenders have been suggested from Shropshire for about the same time, but for our purposes it doesn't matter hugely. In both cases, the essential elements which would become the basis for railway track were present. They had raised rails, which were wooden at this point, that were laid over land rather than simply in a mine, as had been the case up until then. And by the late 18th century, there were hundreds of miles of these wagonways or tram roads across Britain, with the motive power being provided by horses, or men in some cases. And although some were primitive and the low weights and slow speeds meant they could get away with looser engineering, they were gradually improved, which inevitably led to developments that would be important when locomotives arrived soon afterwards. If you want more detail on the evolution of track, then I recommend checking out Andrew Dow's excellent book, The Railway, British Track Since 1804. That's where quite a lot of the information in this section has uh, come from. But for now, let's take a quick look at the most important developments. First, switching. Switching was present from the earliest wagonways that we've got any information for, albeit originally it was fairly straightforward. That they'd simply use a loose piece of track uh, as a stub switch, and it was manually shifted to direct the wagon onto the desired track. Which of course is easy enough, and probably all you need, if you're moving at a walking pace, and each horse-drawn wagon has someone specific leading it. Flanged wheels were used as early as 1676, and obviously the wheels themselves were still made of wood at that point, point. 
cast iron wheels were introduced in 1729 in Colebrookdale in Shropshire, which is one of the other candidates for that um, early uh, wagonway, where just under 40 years later, in 1767, Richard Reynolds cast the first iron track as well. So that's Colebrookdale for both cast iron wheels and the first iron track. Reynolds's rails were actually U-shaped channels, more like the Diolcos from a couple of thousand years earlier than the rails that we're used to now. Though they wouldn't have lasted quite as long, I expect. Cast iron was notoriously brittle, but solving that would need to wait a while. Before that was solved, though, the next significant development would be made at Dowlay in Wales, where iron edge rails were introduced in 1791. Dowlay is only a mile or so down the road from Penny Darren. William Jessop had painted his own edge rails two years earlier uh, than Dowlay in 1789, but it wasn't until 1793 that they were used in, uh, in Loughborough. So the Dowlay rails have the honour of being first. But it was Jessop's rails that introduced the famous fish belly design, where the bottom of the rails is curved to give a middle that's deeper than the ends. The extra depth strengthened the unsupported part of the rail. Through the 1790s, as iron rails spread further, substantial stone sleepers started to be used to support them, and by 1801 it was becoming common practice to ensure the ground beneath the track, known as the formation of the line, was as level as possible, and to cover that with a layer of broken stone ballast to provide a stable base for the sleepers. Rail designs like Jessop's, with individual lengths of track fixed separately, meant that the rails could move independently, and they did. Since using cast iron meant the rail lengths were usually short, usually no more than about three feet, that meant there could be a lot of misaligned joints. And that was a problem when you were carrying wagons of coal as it jostled the wagon and could lead to the load being thrown out. It would have been a bigger problem when the cargo was passengers who were more likely to complain than coal. Anyway, one solution was the use of the joint chair. Chairs were developed in 1797 and were simply cast iron brackets that held the rails to the sleepers. Joint chairs followed soon afterwards. They were placed at the end of the rails and, as the name suggests, held both rails together. Another solution, often used in combination with joint chairs, was scarf joints. Scarf joints have been used in carpentry for building since at least the 1200s, to make one, uh, the edge of each rail was cut at an angle, so they make opposite wedges which fit together. If you imagine looking down on one, the improvement for a loco is obvious. Instead of the transition from one rail to the next being an abrupt line, the scarf joint makes it much more gradual. Long before continuous welding was feasible, scarf joints and joint chairs reduced the shocks to the machines and passengers as they passed over the joints. So, by 1800, railway track was fairly well evolved. Lots of the teething troubles had been worked out with lighter, slower traffic, and they were almost ready for the coming of the steam age. But before these tracks would really be suitable for locos, the iron itself still needed improvement. As I mentioned earlier, cast iron is brittle, and while it was suitable for horse-drawn wagonways, it simply couldn't cope with the extra stress that came from the weight and action of a loco. When Richard Trevithick, who will meet in the next episode, ran his engine on the tram road at Penny Darren in February 1804, it broke the cast iron track plates, and in at least one instance, the Kilmarnock and Troon Railway in 1817, steam locomotion was actually abandoned due to the frequency of plate breakages, and the railway returned to horsepower. Interestingly, that had been a certain George Stevenson's first sales order, which probably goes to show something about the value of perseverance, doesn't it? Anyway, Two developments were made between the first iron rails in 1767 and the launch of the Liverpool and Manchester in 1830. The first one was malleable iron, which was used for the first time on the Aloha Wagon Way in Scotland near Stirling in 1785. Malleable iron is made by reheating cast iron. If you do it correctly, it changes the arrangement of the carbon inside the iron, which makes it less brittle and more able to withstand the sort of punishment that locos would dish out. The second was the invention of wrought iron rolled rails by John Birkinshaw in 1820. Birkinshaw didn't invent wrought iron or rolling. Rolling had been known in Britain since the 1500s, and wrought iron had been around since prehistory. It's what the Celts used. But it was Birkinshaw who brought the two together into a method to make rails that were much longer and stronger than any that had been made before. 
The rails that have been used until now tended to be about three feet long, as I mentioned earlier. The new ones using Birkinshaw's process could be up to 18 feet long. In practice, they were usually more like 15, but even that's a five-fold improvement. Both malleable and wrought iron were used for rails for the next few decades. Iron rails were completely key to making steam locos practical, because they were more robust and they reduced the friction, which allowed greater weights to be carried. Though interestingly, that lack of friction itself was seen as a potential problem, as we'll see when we look at early locomotives in the next episode. Before we move on, though, it's interesting to consider one final implication of all the improvements that had gone into the track, the need for capital. Andrew Dow points out that iron rails offered great savings in maintenance costs, and that's obviously true. But the other thing it did was massively increase the upfront investment and skew the playing field in favour of those who could make that sort of upfront investment. As the entry for Aloha in the old statistical account of Scotland in 1793 points out, the first expense of making this kind of wagonway is undoubtedly great. Yet the proprietor has been long ago reimbursed and is a considerable gainer. It's worth keeping this in mind in the era of the railway company that we're about to enter, and when we think about the railway manias later in the series. So by the early 1820s we've got a serviceable track, but how did it get installed? Who actually built the railways? That brings us to the third of our elements, people. As you'd expect, depending on who's answering the question, there are three possible answers. One, the engineers, men like the Stevensons and Brunel, they're the usual answer to this question. Two, the great contractors like Thomas Brassey, who organised and coordinated the work. And finally, three, the labourers who did the actual work itself. I want to do my best to include all three in this series, but I'll be honest up front, it gets progressively harder for each group. The great Victorian engineers, both civil and mechanical, have been well served over the years, so it's pretty easy to find material on them. And since I have no intention for this to become some sort of revisionist take on history, we're definitely going to talk about them. The second group is largely unknown in the public mind, but if you're prepared to dig through dusty old books, and I definitely am, then you can find information on them too. And a bunch of it's fascinating, so we'll have plenty to say about them, and they're often rags to riches to rags again stories. The third group, the labourers or navvies, have been largely missing in most general histories. There are academic studies and a couple of good specific histories, but as Anthony Burton says about the canal navvy, who we'll meet in a minute, the first difficulty in trying to determine facts about the canal navvy and his life is that everyone ignored him, except for the occasions when he was off on one of his periodic bursts of rioting. That's true for the canal navvy, but it's no less true for the railway navvy. Still, I intend to include information about them whenever I can. We'll have an episode dedicated to them specifically when we get to 1846 and the Parliamentary Select Committee that did a review into their living conditions. Until we reach that point, it's important to keep in mind that for all of our focus on engines, engineers and contractors, the railways had to be physically built by flesh and blood men. So, What was the state of these three groups by 1825? Where had they come from? Well, the last question has a very quick answer, and I implied it earlier from Anthony Burton's quote, canals. But to answer the first question, and flesh out the last one of it, let's look at each of them in turn. We can cover the engineers very quickly, because we'll talk a fair bit about them over the next few episodes. They form the backbone of the early part of our story. Up to the period we're talking about here, the majority of the engineers were self-taught. At this stage, there was no established profession for them to rise through, although they'd be established fairly quickly. The Institute of Civil Engineers was started in 1818, with Thomas Telford as its first president, and the Institute of Mechanical Engineers followed shortly afterwards in 1847. But while they may have been self-taught, they did inherit the hard-won lessons of two very long-established traditions – military engineers and blacksmiths and mechanics. The formal practice of engineering had a long history in the military. The Royal Engineers traced their history back either to engineers who came over with William the Conqueror or to Henry V's 1415 Board of Ordnance, depending on how you're counting. In either case, though, military engineering was a long-established practice. Fast forward to the 16th and 17th centuries, 
and canals and toll roads are beginning to cross the country. Building a canal means making cuts to level the ground, building embankments, tunnels and aqueducts. This all sounds familiar, I'm sure. And the men responsible for designing them could turn to the lessons learned by previous generations of military engineers. By 1830, 4,000 miles of canals had been built across Britain, encountering and overcoming challenges that were often identical to those that the railways would hit. All of this gave a solid base of understanding for the early railway engineers to build on. In fact, most of the early railway engineers, like the Rennies, worked on the canals as well, so they'd got direct knowledge and experience they could then apply to the railways. The other tradition that the engineers could build on was the metal workers and mechanics. We'll focus on what would become mechanical engineering when we look at motive power in the next episode, but for now we can simply say that it was able to build on centuries of knowledge and experience, solving practical problems by direct experiment. Men like Richard Trevithick were able to quite literally learn at the coalface. Our second group, the contractors who would organise the building of the railways, was a much newer type of creature than the engineer, but they didn't come out of thin air either. At the start of the canal period, which was about the early to mid 1700s, the company building the canal usually employed the men doing the work directly, but it didn't take long for the benefits of intermediaries to become obvious. The first signs of contractors sitting between the workers and the company were small steps. The company might have an agreement with a local mason to build a particular bridge, and in addition to their own labour, they'd occasionally use smaller companies to provide manpower for the earthworks. To build any reasonable length of canal would need many such agreements, and of course it exposed the canal company to all of the risk. So over time, this evolved into a relationship between the canal company and a series of larger contractors who were responsible for providing their own men and equipment to deliver an outcome. There were still usually several of these contractors building separate stretches of a canal, not to mention the canal company's own labour as well on different stretches, but it was at least the start of a model we'd recognise on the railways. By the 1790s and the first decade of the 19th century, a number of reasonably sized contractors, the Pinkerton family, Hugh McIntosh, and Jolliffe and Banks amongst others, were working on canals up and down the country. None of them reached the scale that we'll see later for the railway contractors, but the basic arrangement was in place, and with it the tiers that would become the basis of the railway system. At the top was the company itself who appointed an engineer. The engineer would oversee the company's contract with a prime contractor who was paid by the length of canal cut, or railway laid in years to come. The contractor farmed out the work to subcontractors. The subcontractors employed gangers, and gangers would employ a butty gang of around 10 men to do the actual work. While this would be the system that would work to such good effect on the railways in the mid-19th century, it's interesting that the early lines reverted for a while to the same direct labour approach as the early canals. The only explanation I can think of for this is that, because they happened to grow out of colliery railways, the owners had a ready supply of labour in the miners themselves. But in any case, it didn't last long, and the overwhelming majority of the 20,000 miles of railway track that would be laid over the 19th century used the contractor-subcontractor-ganger model. So, that leaves us with the navvies themselves. While there are no exact numbers, by the 1850s, the number of navvies working on the railways was estimated at about 250,000. So who were they, and where did they suddenly come from? Well, by now the answer to the second question is probably obvious. Canals. As most people know, the name navvy itself comes from the canal workers. The men building the canals were originally called navigators, or navigation engineers, which was shortened to navvies. And the name stuck for the men who would later build the railways. What's less well known is how much continuity there was between the two groups. In just about every way that matters, the railway navvy was a continuation of the canal navvy of a generation before. The features of the railway navvy that would be so distinctive, the huge numbers of outsiders, their strength, their reputation for fighting and lawlessness, even the shanty towns they had to live in and the truck system and tommy shops that their bosses used to underpay them, they were all present in their forebears. So to understand the railway navvy at the start of the railway age, let's look at the canal navvy. By the end of the 18th century, there were 50,000 navvies. None of them were working on railways, yet. Instead, like the contractors, 
they'd grown up with the canals. But where does a workforce of 50,000 men come from? To say nothing of the quarter of a million it would turn into by the middle of the 1800s. We can get one idea out of the way pretty quickly. They weren't all Irish. David Brooke has convincingly calculated that no more than about 26% of the navvies on any one railway were Irish. On some railways, it was as low as 2%. Even if we allow for some under-reporting, this is still very different to the popular version that just equates navvies with the Irish. In fact, a large proportion of the original workforces were local men. They were recruited by the company or the landowner from amongst farm labourers in the area. Until about this time, many of these workers had supplemented their seasonal income from agricultural labour with cottage industries like weaving. But since the mid-1700s, the new factories in the cities had been gradually replacing the cottage industries. This was not an easy time to be one of the landless poor. So many of them turned to building the canals and the coming of the railways later provided even more work. The work was gruelling, though, and many of the labourers simply weren't up to the hard physical labour. Thomas Brassey, who we'll again we'll meet later, expected that the average navvy would fill seven wagons per day. Depending on what they were digging through, that means lifting between 15 and 20 tonnes of muck a day. But it paid well. Although there was a lot of variation over the 150 or so years the navvies were a force, and it certainly differed from place to place and contractor to contractor, in the early 1800s, a navvy earned about two to three times what an agricultural labourer made. So as the work moved on, some of the workers went with it. It was these men who became the real navvies, men who travelled with the contractors and did the heaviest of the labour. By the time we get to the height of the railway era, and Brassy was taking contracts to build lines in other countries, he was often taking his crews with him abroad. But long before that, the canal navvies had already learned the value that their unique combination of strength, experience and low expectations of safety could bring them, and had started to rove the country following the work. Often, more than a thousand men would be employed in an area on work that was by its nature temporary. Inevitably, they outstripped the housing in the local villages, assuming there even were villages nearby. Both canals and railways obviously cross areas with no housing whatsoever. In an age when it's easy to commute, we forget that at the time we're talking about, people had to live near where they worked. And if the place you work is in the middle of a moor, then it's going to be difficult to come by decent accommodation. So the companies built temporary housing for the men. By which, of course, I mean they got the men to build it themselves. Then took rent out of their wages for it. In any case, sometimes they were wooden huts, but more often than not, they were simply stacks of turf sods. This was the situation in 1794 when the Huddersfield Canal was built, and it was still the case in 1875 when the navvies were building the Settle and Carlisle, the last railway to be built by navvies solely without machinery. Although the railways brought new elements to the work, the basic work of tunnelling, digging, embankment and bridge building remained the same. So when the railway companies were being formed and they needed someone to design the lines to organise the huge workforces necessary and to carry out the actual work itself, the people were already in place. Between them, they'd already built thousands of miles of canals. Which brings us finally to rolling stock, the fourth of the things I said was necessary for a functioning railway. I've left it till last because up until 1825 there's not really a lot to be said about it. The railways right up to the Stockton and Darlington, perhaps even the Liverpool and Manchester, had rolling stock as something of an afterthought. But let's quickly review where we are in the mid-1820s. Goods wagons had of course been used since the very earliest wagonways, their whole point being to carry the outputs of mines. But there'd never been a great deal of thought put into their development. I suppose Cole doesn't really complain about how uncomfortable it is. There was still a great deal of variation in the body, something that would in fact persist right up until nationalisation, when the new British railways inherited one and a quarter million wagons of 480 body styles. However, that's a long way in the future, and by 1825, a broad consensus had at least been reached for the design of the chassis and the wheels. In that year, Nicholas Wood, who will meet as one of the judges at the Rainhill Trials in a couple of episodes' time, was able to describe the most common design of the undercarriage and wheels, at least as it applies to edge rails. 
The frame was of wood, oak if possible, and they ran on four cast iron wheels which had been case hardened to prevent them being damaged by the rail. The axles were made of wrought iron with a square end fixed into the centre of the wheel. They rotated within chain bearings and were braked by a long lever that acted on both wheels on one side simultaneously. There'd be two of these levers, one for each side. So, so much for goods, what about people? Well, oddly, the idea of carrying people came surprisingly late. In 1819, Robert Stevenson wrote a report on the Midlothian Railway. Well, uh, not that Robert Stevenson, I should say, son of George. This is the lighthouse Robert. Just to confuse things, he also worked on the railways. We could call him Robert Louis Stevenson, except that just confuses things further because he wrote Treasure Island. This one is that one's grandfather. So, having cleared all of that up, in 1819, Robert Stevenson wrote a report for the Midlothian Railway, which said, A regular system of travelling on railways, or the conveyance of passengers, has not been attempted, excepting perhaps from Kilmarnock to Troon. He was right to call out the Kilmarnock and Troon Railway in Ayrshire. It had started running a regular passenger service on the 27th of June 1812. There was another one that he doesn't seem to have known about, which is the Oystermouth Railway in Wales, which had been carrying passengers since 1807. But both of these were horse-drawn services, pulling just regular stagecoaches. The Kilmarnock and Troon was a plateway, so the coach just ran on the plates with no alterations whatsoever. The Oystermouth had edged rails, so they'd adapted the wheels of the coach, so they'd got flanges and could run on the edge rails. Carriages designed specifically for the railway would have to wait a couple of years, but as the Kilmarnock and Troon and the Oystermouth show, people were at least starting to see the possibilities, and as we get into the next stage of our story, we'll meet people like Thomas Worsdell, who would start a carriage-building dynasty. So, that covers three of our four essential elements for a railway. But what about the last and possibly most important one? What was going to provide the motive power for these railways? In the next episode, we'll start to answer that question. And, spoiler alert, Leo, the answer isn't quite as clear-cut as we'd like, even by the end of 1825, it's going to be steam-powered locos. So, come and join me on the next episode as we look at the development of the locomotive. If you're enjoying the show, please like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, you can find relevant images and links to the source material I used for research on historyoftherailways.com, where you'll also find ways to support the show. If you want to get in touch, then just drop me a line at michael at historyoftherailways.com or follow us on Facebook and join the conversation there. So tell your friends to come and join us on the next episode we get distracted, fascinated and yes, even sidetracked by the stories from the history of the railways.